With that, I'd like to welcome everyone again to Microsoft Publisher, Simple Desktop Publishing at Your Fingertips. We'll be joined today by Leslie Cole of Microsoft, who I'll introduce in just a little bit. But again, my name is Becky Wiegand. I'm an Interactive Events Producer here at TechSoup. I have been an editor and a staff writer here, and previously worked at a variety of small nonprofits both in California and Washington, D.C., where I was an accidental, accidental techie trying to solve the technology problems at my office without a lot of technology expertise. So in addition to facilitating today's event, I'll be talking about some of my experiences using Publisher and tips on graphic design and just general principles of working with printers, developing print materials and collateral, and sharing resources where you can learn more. So looking at today's agenda, We'll be talking about who TechSoup is in case you're not familiar. We'll be doing a poll or two, and we'll introduce you to Publisher 2013 and some of the new features that have been introduced. Um, Leslie will walk us through a live demo of some of the features of Publisher. We'll talk about best practices for design and print, and we'll talk about how you can get donated copies of Publisher if you don't have it already, and then we'll spend time on Q&A. And like I mentioned earlier, feel free to chat in the chat window at the bottom of your screen. Throughout the presentation you can ask questions, and we have people on the back end who will be capturing those. So you'll see Michael DeLong and Nicole Hees in the background. You may also see Gretchen Deo from Microsoft, and they'll be there to respond to your questions and to capture them for the Q&A section. So quickly, just to give you a little bit of background about TechSoup, if you're not familiar with who we are, we are part of TechSoup Global. We are a nonprofit, and we are working toward the day when every nonprofit, library, and social benefit organization has the technology, knowledge, and resources they need to operate at their full potential. In part of providing that, we try to give you webinars and articles, blog posts, forums, um, community to participate in to help you solve your technology problems. And we also run donation programs with companies like Microsoft. So here are a few stats about our impact in our sectors with nonprofits and libraries as of last June. If you haven't visited our website lately, we have relaunched and we have a new and improved website that's hopefully a bit easier for you to find your way around on. It's just at www.techsoup.org. So visit us there to find more webinars and events like this, as well as additional resources, articles, and product donations. So I'd like to go ahead and do a quick couple of polls to see where our audience is at with Publisher. So what's your experiencing, experience with using Publisher so far? Have you never used it? Have you rarely used it? Occasionally, regularly, or should you be hosting this webinar as the expert presenter? Go ahead and just take a moment and we'll let people respond, and then we'll show the results to see what our audience participates with, uh, pu with Publisher. What your experience is. Okay, I'm just going to give another couple of seconds. So we have most people participating. Five, four, three, two, and one. We'll skip to the results here. So most of our audience are occasional users of Publisher. And we have about 107 people online right now. So that's a pretty good chunk of people that use it once in a while, and almost 30% that use it pretty regularly. So hopefully we'll be able to provide you with some new information, some new features, and some tips on how to use it even better at your organization. One more poll for you just to get an idea of which version people are using. Are people using just Publisher as a standalone product? or do you have it installed as part of an Office Suite? And if so, which version? It's helpful for us to know so that we know if you're using an older version and what the differences may be, or if you're using a newer version. Again, I'll just give a few seconds more to let people respond, and then we'll go to the results. Okay, so five, four. Three, two, one. 
So about half of our audience is using Office 2010. And that's great because that's actually what I have installed on my computer that I'm using today. So we will, Leslie will be able to do some live demonstration of the 2013 version. And during the portion where I'm talking, I can show a little bit of the 2010 version and where things live. There aren't too many changes that are dramatic between the two um, in a good way. <laughs> that where things are in 2010 are where you can find them for the most part in 2013. So with those questions under our belts, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Leslie Cole. She is part of Microsoft, and she will be talking to us today about her experience designing with Publisher and introing the product for us. So Leslie, welcome to the call. Thanks, Becky. Hello, everyone. I'm actually pretty happy to hear that Publisher is being used by as many of you as are using it. Um, we're not always sure. For those of you who are new to Publisher, I hope after today's webinar you might decide to download the free one-month trial to find out more about how Publisher can meet your desktop publishing needs. And for those of you who have used Publisher in the past, and it sounds like there are quite a few of you, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised by the changes in Publisher 2013. I'll demo a few of those features a little later on. To start with, the new interface in Publisher 2010 was called the Ribbon. Sounds like about half of you have used the Ribbon. I've been using it a while now. And I'm finding it much easier to find template design and printing options in Publisher. And I will show you that. If you've been using an older uh, version of Publisher, you'll be happy to learn that many of the new templates are available to you online for use in Publisher 2013. But do be warned, the new templates probably won't work with your old version of the product. So um, you might want to consider an upgrade to Publisher uh, 2013. Also brand new in 2013 is a publication scratch area that makes it much easier to choose and manage your images. And later I'll show you more about using the scratch area and some of those new design elements in Publisher 2013. Right now I want to show you around the Publisher 2013 ribbon. So I'm going to share my publisher now and hope that all of you can see this. I'm going to open a blank publication. And you'll notice the tabs along the top. Now this is not new to those of you who have been using 2010. But for those of you who are new, each tab has a different set of commands. And mostly I think you'll be using the Page Design tab and the File menu, which some of you will recognize these commands here. Those are the, ones, those are the tabs that I'll be talking about mostly today. And Lindsay, just to, or I'm sorry, Leslie, just to jump in quickly, if people um, can't see very well when she's showing her desktop, there's a button at the top of your screen to show full screen so you can see things a little bit more clearly. So feel free to click on that to show the screen a little bit more in detail if you need. I understand that someone might be helping me here with a poll to find out what types of publications most folks are going to be creating. Yep, Is we can go ahead and pop right? that open. Yep, and this Great. is just to help us get an understanding of what types of materials you create at your nonprofit or library or other organization. Or if you're really looking for a tool to use for all of the above and more. So take a moment and let us know what things you're mostly going to be looking at you creating using Publisher. While we wait for those responses. And you responses. select as many as you want. Go oh ahead, yeah, Leslie. that would be great. While we're waiting for those responses, I'd like to give you one piece of Publisher advice that I hope you'll take away with you today. And that is to start with a template. Um, Publisher has new and improved templates for brochures, newsletters, flyers, postcards, 
cards, certificates, everything on this list here, as a matter of fact. And some of those Great. And I'm going to go ahead and skip to the results. Sorry. Oh, sure. I'm going to go ahead and just skip to the results so we can see what people use. And that will continue to change as people answer. But most people are looking at using it for brochures, newsletters, flyers. Those are the big ones. And okay. smaller amounts for the different areas. But it's um, a good spread across where you know, there are 20% that are looking to use it for all of the above. So that's a pretty big margin that you need it for your everyday work. That's good to know because there are new templates available for, especially for Publisher 2013, although you'll find some new Publisher 2010 templates as well. Um, the advantages, and many of you will know this, but the advantages to using templates are many. Templates are well designed and laid out from the get-go, so you don't have to design a publication from scratch especially if your skills are not in the design area and you're trying to get something out the door quickly. Um, new designs come online fairly often. And even a template can be customized to reflect your unique brand, especially with the new design options that are available in 2013. This is really nice for small organizations with limited design resources. Maybe you're the CEO also responsible for getting out the newsletter or the brochure. Um, and this is also important if you're using an in-house printer in your organization. These are all reasons that Publisher 2013 excels as a design aid. I'm going to demo finding a brochure template and creating a brochure since most of you said that you're creating brochures. All right. So we are still on creating a publication. Publisher Start Screen, Publisher 2013. And we're going to create a brochure. And right here under the search box are suggested searches. I'm going to click Brochure. And what comes up are many brochures, templates, options. I happen to like this one. So I'm going to click it. It's a new Northwind Traders. It's called Brochure. It's got nice areas for photographs. It's nicely designed. If I click these arrows at the bottom here, I can get a, a better idea of what the brochure template looks like. And I'm going to use this one. So I'll click Create right here. You can see on the left in the viewing pane that I can click either of these. And the first thing that most of us do when we start with a template is to choose our images to replace these when we start customizing our brochure. So I'm going to go right up here to the Insert tab. And there's a command here called Online Pictures. So I click that. I'm going to do a Bing search on cats. Maybe we have some cat lovers in the audience. And I have a lot of options here. So I'm going to choose five or six with various orientations. Oh, how did that happen? There we go. And down here you can see that there were five items selected, so I'm going to insert those. And you'll notice that they all come up here in the scratch area. I'm unselecting those, deselecting those. And I'm going to start replacing my photographs with photographs from my scratch area. So I select a photograph. And you'll notice that there's a little icon here that comes up with a mountain on it. And I click it with my mouse, and I drag it. And there's a pink box that shows around it. And I let go of my mouse. And you'll notice that 
it's replaced the picture with my new picture, and the old picture is over here in the scratch area, ready to use whenever I need it. It's very handy. Let's see what happens when you use a picture without the orientation of the area that you're going to. So these pictures are going to snap right in here. And you'll notice that all of the pictures are over here as you need them. All right, I'm going to unshare here and go back to the desktop. Becky? I've gone ahead and clicked the Stop Sharing button too, so it's just going to take a moment to get us back to the slides. Hopefully everybody's Super. seeing the slides now. There you go. Yep. Because I'm a content person and I'm not a design professional, I appreciate that Publisher makes it so that I don't have to play around with design details and I can get information out the door quickly. So there are some new text and graphics options that make it even easier to de design a brochure that looks like it came from your organization and not some cookie cutter template. I'd like to take a look at some of those new design options right now. So we're back to our brochure, back in the publication we created. And remember that I told you the Page Design tab is where you'll find most of the design options. So I'm going up to the Page Design tab, and you'll find color schemes on the Page Design tab that are pre-coordinated so that you can find one that matches your organization brand, or maybe campaign colors for an event or a fundraising drive that you're promoting. And you can roll through each of these options to see a live preview without committing to a color scheme until you're ready. I like this one. Now, you'll notice that when you click an image or text as I'll show you, new tabs come up with new options. Here at the top we've got the Picture Tools tab because I have this picture selected. And I'll click Format. And there are several new design options with the same le um, live preview that I showed you just a moment ago with color schemes. You can also go here, here to Picture Effects and choose some shadowing. I like some of the reflection options are nice, so I'll choose that. And as I said, when you click a text box, you'll also get a new set of tabs to help you customize your text. Now you can change the size, the font, but you can also go here and choose text effects. So whatever you've selected, you can apply a new effect to. I'll use that. Now that you've customized the template, let's assume that you're ready to print your publication for distribution. I'm going to unshare right now and go back to the slides. This is the one I want. One guideline for printing is to choose your desktop printer, copy shop, or commercial printer based on the number of copies that you need or the finishing work that you need done. 
These and the capabilities of your desktop printer are going to determine whether you can print in-house. And I'm trying to get to the print slide here so that you can – there we go. But whether you're using an in-house printer or a commercial printer, either way, you can prepare your publication for printing by using the print, share, and export options on the file tab that I showed you earlier. Let's just take a look. So we've completed our publication. We're coming over here to the File menu. And the Save options are pretty much as they've always been for you, you, those of you who are familiar with Office and, and past versions of Publisher. Print is probably the option that you'll use for your in-house printer. You get a print preview. You have options about what you're printing on here. You get to choose your printer here. And the big print button allows you to print your publication. What I'd like to show you that's really cool in 2013 are the export options. Now these were available in earlier versions, but they've been enhanced a little bit. So for example, you've decided that you can get a deal at Costco and you want to save your publication publication for photo printing. So we click that. And this particular option allows you to save a set of images that you can then take to your photo center and have your publication printed. So let's say I choose TIFFs, usually photo centers like TIFFs or JPEGs, and I save the image set. I click OK. It saves those set, that set of images wherever I want to, in this case to my computer. And then I can take that set of images to the Photoshop to have them printed. Another option is save for a commercial printer. This is a little bit of a misnomer because you can save a file to the quality that you want. For example, you could choose commercial press, but you can also minimize the size of the file in case you have to send the file to a small set of individuals who are going to view it online, say your board members. So you click Minimum Size, and you use the Pack and Go Wizard. I won't click it now, but um, you do as exactly as I showed you before. You'll click the Pack and Go Wizard and save your files, and then attach those files to your email. Also, for commercial publishers, often they want you to give them a PDF file in addition to the publisher file, or maybe just a PDF file. And so these get automatically created when you choose this option, and then click this Pack and Go Wizard. And that's it. You've created a publication in a, a relatively short amount of time. I hope I've showed you a few new things that you'll be able to use in Publisher 2013. And let me know if you have questions. What I can't answer, I'll be sure to find the answer to. I did add some resources to the resource list that you'll see later in the presentation, I believe. One of them is a link to a one-month free trial of the Office Suite, and specifically Publisher 2013 if you'd like to give it a whirl. There's also a Make the Switch to Publisher 2013 video for those of you who used earlier ver versions of the product and would like to um, get some tips on how to make the switch to the new version. There's the Microsoft Answers Forum, which is a community forum where people, actual people, will answer your questions about Publisher, and many of them are experts at Publisher and can give you excellent answers to your questions. And finally, there's the Microsoft Publisher Office blog. It hasn't been updated recently, but the information, the blog posts that are up there are still great sources of information and uh, wonderful tips and tricks for using the new version of Publisher. I hope this has been helpful. Great. Thank you, Leslie. We still have a second half to go through, but I'd like to jump in with a few questions from users 
who've asked some specific things in response to your presentation. So a couple of people asked questions about, can you talk a little bit more about the the plugin or the sorry, the pack and go wizard. Can you explain that a little bit more, what that is, or maybe show it again in case it wasn't clear? Sure. Let me do that right now. I'm going to share my screen Thank again. You. So it can be found on the file menu as I showed you. Let me just get you there once again. Here it is over on the left. File, Export. And basically what the Pack and Go Wizard does is prepares your file for printing or distribution. So um, I, I wonder if there are more specific questions about the Pack and Go Wizard. I hope that's um, clear. It's preparing your files for you. So for example, when I was talking about clicking this option, say for a commercial printer, you're choosing options that are creating um, a file size that's manageable for a certain kind of use for your file. For example, if you are taking your file to a um, to a copy shop like Costco, you might choose high quality printing here to get the file, a file size that's manageable to save. And you just um, click that. You'd click this. And when you use the Pack and Go Wizard, you're basically saving this file, this publication that you made in a format that's for the use you want and you can save it to your computer, and then you move it to a thumb drive and just take it to your copy shop. So it's, it's really compressing your files in a way that you need them. I hope that's So clear. for example, printers, commercial printers, like if you went to an actual printing shop to get a batch of 5,000 postcards for an annual event done, they typically like to see a PDF or an XPS file with a certain yes. resolution. And so those are things that you don't necessarily need to really know inside out if you use the Pack and Go Wizard because it will do that for you. Whereas if you're saving it to print photos, it will probably save it as a TIFF or a JPEG, which is a better format for uploading it to the Costco photo printing where you can print out 5 by 7 photos um, online or whatever company you choose to use. So it helps take out some of the guesswork if you're not familiar with, with um, you know, the different standards that printers look for, whether it's you know, a commercial printer doing a huge batch run for you, or whether it's you know, doing it as a photo, or whether it's saving it just for your own use. Somebody also asked, what's the save for another computer for? And I'm not quite sure what that feature is for. So do you know anything more about that, Leslie? Um, I haven't used it to be honest, but I believe save for another computer is – let me just click it here. Let's see. Let's find out. I looked through it recently. So it's just preparing to take your publication to another computer. Again, you click it. You click OK. And you're saving it in a format that allows you to put it on a, a thumb drive and take it to another computer. And these are all features that you can customize if you want to be you know, involved in what the pixels per inch are for your images, or if you want to be more involved in that, you can still access that information. But this just makes it a little bit easier for people who aren't necessarily experts in what's needed by printers. That's right. right we had a few other questions come in. Um, so I'll go ahead and just field a couple of them to you, and then I'll go ahead and get started on the next section. So one person asked, can you explain how to resize the pictures where you had them in the scratch pad and moved them into the template and it automatically sized them? Well, what if you wanted to move them into the template but not have it resize them or wanted to make it fit into a template differently? How would you go about resizing it? Oh, good question. Now let's see if I can go back to that and show you. When you, I just right clicked that particular image, and I'm going down to Format. And Format Picture is, is basically the same as it has always been. This dialog box hasn't changed much over the years. 
And if you go to size, there are ways to manually size your picture here. I love the, the scratch pad and the image feature because I find it so frustrating to resize pictures. But people can also just click on the picture on the template itself and stretch it or move it if yes. they want to, correct? Exactly. So they can so you still do that it. as well. Yeah. And there, for example, stretch that kitty out. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Great. You do run well, there into are a lot more questions coming in. Um, so with that, why don't we go ahead and move on to the next section, and we still are collecting all those questions, so we'll have more time at the end to get through some of them, or hopefully most of them. And I'd like to go ahead and move us along to talk about some best practices for design, which we um, promoted in the webinar that we would collect best practices from across nonprofits and libraries. Many of these were suggestions that were brought to us through conversations in our community forums, articles that we've written as nonprofits ourselves, and worked with libraries on best practices as well. So some of these are fairly obvious, but they often get forgotten. So when you're first thinking about developing your design, make sure that you are incorporating whatever your product is, whatever your end collateral item, whether it's a brochure or a flyer, make sure that it's incorporated into your overall marketing strategy. There should be a clear goal to every piece. So is the point of your brochure to be informational? Is the point of your flyer to get people to attend an event? Is it to get people to donate? Is it just to let them know what your organization's goal is? Is it to volunteer? Make sure that that's really clear. And bottom line up front, this is actually something from the military that they use, bluff. Bottom line up front means it should be really clear to whoever is reading it from the very beginning of opening it up or looking at it that what your goal is and what you want from them, what you need them to understand, whether it's a compelling story or an emotional connection to your organization. You want them to understand it from your piece. Working on a consistent voice and brand. And we say look to your website. And we know not everybody has a website or maybe doesn't have an ideal website. But you want to try and make sure that your voice, your brand, your fonts, your colors are all connected to your overall look and feel. And that might be something that you have a more ideal look and feel in your Facebook pages where you have images up or you are able to tell your story a little bit more flexibly than your own website. So look to those things to get a starting point for where you would want your design to go. Defining your audience for each piece. So again, is that piece intended to get people to show up and volunteer? Is the newsletter intended for your biggest fans who already love you and know you and speak your internal jargon or language? Or is it for people who don't know you? That should help shape what kind of language you use, what kind of pictures you use. Offer ways to engage and include your website on everything. Those are just some points to make sure that people can find a way to get back to you if there's not a clear option or if, if maybe they don't want to donate, there's still another way to engage them as a volunteer or get them to come to an event. Um, TechSoup last year rewrote an article with some step-by-step -step instructions for creating a custom donor thank you postcard. We didn't actually use a template for it because we wanted to lay out the steps for creating it from scratch, from a blank screen which I know our advice in this webinar is very much to start with a template. And I, I heartily agree with that from years of doing this kind of work myself, that it's always easier to start with something on the page than to look at a blank screen. But we know that there are times that templates don't fit everything. So we created um, a, just a donor thank you postcard, and we wrote it in an article with every step outlined. And we used Office 2010 because 2013 was not yet out. So you can look to this article, which you'll have the link to this after the webinar, to give you step-by-step -step if you're looking for more detail on how to create every part of a document or an item yourself. Get creative. If you haven't used the creative brief before as part of your marketing or outreach strategy, there are great templates out there that are for 
created for anybody, but marketing professionals use these in for-profit industries all the time to help define the message, to help define their audience, to help suss out what the goal is of a piece. And even though it might seem like, oh, that's way too much work, it really can be 10 minutes of just sitting down and thinking about it before you put virtual pen to virtual pad to help you understand what you really want to get out of it and what the focus of an item should be. Think outside the paper. So when you're designing, thinking inside the paper might be looking at a border uh, like what we have shown on the left here where it's just plopped inside. Thinking outside the paper where you extend your borders is one option to make your work a little bit more creative, a little bit more interesting, and maybe eye-grabbing. Things, simple things like inverting text where you print on a dark color with white font instead can sometimes carry more impact. It might seem obvious, but it's surprising how few people actually do it unless they're a design professional, which I'm not either. But <laughs> these are tips that people have shared with us that really do help make more compelling pieces. Using images that are compelling and tell a story. We just completed a digital storytelling challenge here, and we are having a gala later this week where hundreds of organizations work to tell their stories through images and video. And you can capture some of that in your print materials like your newsletters and your brochures, your flyers, your emails. Some other general tips for design. If you are printing, you want to always try and use high quality and high resolution images and logos. If you don't have a high resolution logo, you may need to go back and find whoever designed it and try and get a nice quality EPS file, which is the print standard for a good quality looking logo that can be printed. Tips like grouping items so you don't accidentally move or delete one element. And this is something we can show if you'd like. I can show you how to do that if you're not familiar, both grouping items and layering items. So I'll go ahead and quickly share one of my applications. And I'm, I'm on the PTO, the nonprofit PTO for my child's school. And so I had just a couple of examples. Hopefully this will pop up. Oops, sorry, I'm showing other things. Let's get it to open. So for example, I don't know if you're able to see this yet, but little flyers, simple things for, oh, there's an open house. Easily, you know, instead of having to make sure that this logo and the title stays the same every time, I can go into Publisher and go into the page design. Here we go. Into the Home tab. This is in Office 2010. And I can just group these items over here in the top under the Arrange section so that now I can't accidentally move them the wrong way separately. They are now grouped together. I can also bring items forward or set them back. So say I want this little paw. There I go moving things that I shouldn't be moving. You can always use the Undo button. <laughs> this is our good friend. Um, say I want to move this little paw to the back so that it's more of a, an imprint. This is a really simple little flyer layout, so this is nothing special. But we often have to do these once a week if we host events at libraries and we need to have a flyer for our patrons. So if there are elements that you use every week, you can save these as your own template as well. Um, you can set it so that your colors are always the same. So you know, for example, if I want this to be the, the colors for the school project, I can set the orange as the color because it matches our logo. And I can make that the look and feel and create a template from that. I'm going to go ahead and get out of sharing. And return to my desktop and the slides. Hopefully you are now able to see the slides again. So those are just a couple of little things 
that we can, and we can show more when we are answering questions in a few minutes. Um, some more tips for if you are printing these with a commercial printer. Um, like we said that the wizard that helps you package the print can help save you from having to worry about some of these things, but saving as 300 pixels per inch minimum for print, that's for both images or text. Uh, saving as a PDF for professional printers rather than as a JPEG. Making sure that when you choose your colors, instead of using RGB colors, that you use CMYK colors, and that's for their print standards. Ask about margins and bleeds. So if you're not sure what a margin or a bleed is, if you have, say, a postcard and you want your image to stretch all the way across the front of the postcard with no white edge, no margin, then you need to make sure you've got a bleed that goes off of the page so that when those postcards are cut that there's no white showing up and that your color of your background covers the entire print. Three millimeters is recommended. There are some simple ways within Publisher to actually just standardize a bleed. And I mentioned earlier image formats that are best for print are EPS and TIFF formats. And again, some of those wizards can help standardize that for you just by saying you want to save it and package it for a professional printer. That way you don't need to worry about some of these things. And here's just an example of what the bleed is because that's something that printers like to throw around. And if you're not somebody who does graphic design full time, you might be like, what are they talking about? So <clears throat> for example, in this image here, the safe area that's in the white, this would be where you want to make sure your important text and information is. This little green area is where your postcard, for example, would be cut. And the bleed would continue beyond that on your print, and you would be cutting off those edges. But it would ensure that you don't end up cutting and getting a white border or getting something that's not supposed to be on your page or getting awkward cut lines that show you know, borders that are you know, like a black border around an image. If you want it to just be a solid color, you've got to include a bleed. Same goes for things like cut lines. If you have a, an invitation and you need it to be folded, there are easy ways within Publisher to insert little lines on your, on your design that show you where a printer would fold an image. So if it's a folded greeting card, those templates for greeting cards already come with those fold lines there. So you don't have to insert them yourself. So that's why those templates and customizing from those can be a really easy way to get started, particularly if you're not a graphic designer or if this isn't your area of expertise. And just a few more tips for printing. If you're printing physically, always ask for and review a proof before printing. It's ideal to have a physical proof if you are using a local printer that can get one over to you. Most printers are, they use drop services where they'll deliver one over by a courier for you to sign off on and send back. You can use a digital print, but digital, or I mean digital proof, but a digital proof can still sometimes not turn out the way you think. So if you have a very specific color of orange that you want for your logo, you want to make sure that it's printing that color in a physical proof and that you sign off on it before you print, especially if you're printing a large batch. Like if you're doing all of your business cards and all of your brochures and all of your newsletters or flyers for a big long period of time, you want to make sure that it's the right color. And always you can ask for help. You can ask for help from the printers that you're working with. Most of them are really familiar with this type of work. And they'll sometimes help you fix your design if it doesn't have what it needs. They can add a bleed area for you. So don't be afraid to ask them for help. Many of them, if it's just small tweaks, they do it for no additional cost. Um, some of them will charge if it's a major thing. Most of them will charge if it's a major thing. But if it's a small thing, ask for help. They can usually guide you. And also use the resources within Publisher. Most of the answers can actually be found within the help questions or the help section of Publisher. So I'd like to go ahead and take a little bit of time just to talk about how to get it if you don't have it or if you'd like to upgrade or if you'd like to be using a different version. 
and then we'll go ahead into questions. So hopefully you're familiar with the TechSoup Microsoft Software Donation Program. We have Publisher as a standalone product available to eligible nonprofits and public libraries for an $8 administrative fee. Office Professional Plus 2013 is available for a $32 admin fee. We also have a 2010 version of that still on our site. If you don't want the 2013 yet, but you say are on 2003 and you want to start using the ribbon, you don't want to make the bigger leap, you can go to a, an intermediary version. And we have Office Standard 2013 for a $24 admin fee. And also one thing we want to make sure that people are aware of is that they can upgrade for no cost with Software Assurance if you've received a donation of an Office Suite or a publisher through TechSoup within the last two years. And you know, Microsoft released Office 2013 in October. So if you've had a valid license with Software Assurance when that was released, you're eligible to upgrade for free through Software Assurance. And you can ask questions in our chat if you want more detail about that. Um, included with Software Assurance are, aside from the upgrades, you can also access e-learnings and trainings online. And there are at least a couple of them, both for Office, or sorry, for Publisher 2010 and 2013, that will walk you through. I think the 2010 one is like a 257-page e-learning that you can do at your own pace. It's a big thing that you can use and access with no additional cost through Microsoft directly through the Volume Licensing Service Center. So we can help you access that if you have a donation that qualifies for that e-learning access with Software Assurance. So I'd like to go ahead and get started with the Q&A. So I'll go and jump into some questions, and then we'll cover some additional resources and wrap things up in the next few minutes here. So Vanessa was asking how to get access to the e-learning trainings. And so we'll have, we have Nicole here on the back end who is one of our client services staff. And if you're not sure whether your account or whether your prior upgrades allow you to access e-learnings through Software Assurance, you can always contact our client services team and they can help you check your account and see when you last requested a donation. So Dorel asked, we do online banner campaigns and search engine ads. Can we create creatives with Microsoft Publisher for online use? So Leslie, can you address that? I believe I that you can. Oh, there we go. I believe you can use Publisher to create banners. Um, there are uh, crop marks that you can use when you're using larger paper sizes and so forth. But I haven't done it myself. I think that you, it's like any other publication. You can create the banner and use the Pack and Go Wizard and take it for professional printing if you'd like to, or you can do it on a desktop printer at home or in the office. Great. Thank you. Um, so we had a question, is the Pack and Go Wizard available in Publisher 2010 as well for the printing options? I can look at it in my Publisher 10. I'm not honestly sure though myself. Do you know offhand, Leslie? I believe the Pack and Go Wizard was available in a form in 2010. It's been vastly retooled and redesigned for 2013, uh, for example, to, um, to be able to take optimize for copy shops. That was new. Um, but I believe the, the Pack and Go Wizard has been around for a few versions. Great. There are a couple of questions about using online art or using pictures off of Bing like your example with the cats. And what about copyright? How do we know if these are legal for us to use? And I, I know the standard answer to this one, but I think you probably have one ready to go too. <laughs> well, Thanks for asking that because I meant to bring up that very point. You want to be really careful about copyright, but many, many of the images on Bing have creative license agreements, which means if you go into the license agreement for that particular image, it will tell you exactly what you're uh, allowed to use that image for. 
often there will be an agreement that says that you can use it, but you can't use it. You can't use the image for profit. Um, so go make sure that you're looking for the license agreement for every single image that you use that is not your own. Great. And one resource we use a lot here at TechSoup is Creative Commons, which you can find a whole like 62 million images on Flickr that are under the Creative Commons section of Flickr, where you can type in Creative Commons and Flickr in your Google engine, and, or whatever engine, search engine, I'm sorry, Bing. <laughs> you, can search for, you can search for Flickr and Creative Commons and find millions of images that are available for a variety of uses without they have copyrights, but some of them are you know, share with anyone. Some of them are you need to only use it for non-commercial purposes, and you need to give us credit and give us attribution. So there are different rules, but many, many images available out there that you can use for your own purposes. And that website that you can look for is creativecommons, C-O-M-M-O-N-S dot org. And we use a lot of Creative Commons images that are hosted on Flickr for putting images up on our blog, out in our newsletters. So it's a great resources, resource out there. Some other questions that we have. Um, so somebody said, I'm new to Publisher 2010. Where is the Undo button? It was my favorite function in 2007. So I can show that if you'd like. It's up in the corner. Let me show my desk top again and see if I can get that to share this application quickly. And I can show you right where that lives because it is one of my favorite buttons too. So if you're able to see this hopefully, it's just that same winter showcase for my kids' school. Way up here at the top left-hand corner is the little Undo button. You can also find it under the File tab. Or maybe it's under the home tab. I'm not exactly sure which tab it's under, but I do know that the little arrow is right there. I'll go back and it's to in the, it's in the same sorry, place in twenty thirteen as well. Great. Just and somebody else place. commented the keyboard keyboard shortcut is control Z, which I use a lot as well. We all need the undo button once in a while, don't we? Oh. In real life and online. Yes. <laughs> All right, some more questions here. We have a question asking about making business cards using a specific Avery card number. So Avery 8371 cards, can that be done in Publisher? And what would be another related question to that was, what would be the benefit of using Publisher versus Word for something like that? Oh, absolutely you can do business cards in Publisher. Publisher really excels at that. In fact, if you type that Avery number into the search box that I showed you within Publisher, I can share my screen again if, it's, if you need me to. But you can type um, Avery8371, and it will show you all the templates that allow you to, that are designed basically to work with 8371. That's great, great. Thank you. We also had a question about do you need to have a newer version of Windows? So I have Windows 7. Would Publisher nope. 13 work on mine without upgrading? Yes. Yep, and I'm also I'm running Windows 7 on my laptop. We aren't Windows 8 here in this office yet. And I've got Publisher 2010 and can easily update to 2013 if and when I want to, which I would like to do at some point soon. Can items revealed in the formatting and other tabs be made visible? So can people see them all the time? So for example, when you're looking in Publisher and those toolbars up at the top that kind of make things hidden in the ribbon, not necessarily hidden, but it doesn't show all of them, can you make those so that they show up there all the time? Uh, if I'm understanding the question, you're wondering if you can pin the ribbon so that it's open all the time. Is that right? I think so. Or pin certain commands to the ribbon. You, yes, you can um, make. Uh, it's called QAT, Quick Access Toolbars. You find it by going to File Options, 
and then pinning specific commands up there in the upper left-hand corner uh, where the undo button is, is where those commands will show up. So that's one thing that you can do. You can also pin the ribbon open, but it does take up screen space and can make your publication harder to view. Great. And I know um, we actually have an article also written last year for the 2010 version of Office about how to customize your ribbon. So we can include a link in that link to that article for the person who asked that so that they can see how to customize and pin different things to their ribbon. So we are just about out of time right now. And there are a few questions we didn't get to, but we'd like you to join us in our community forums to continue the conversation. And we will post a link to where you can do that. I'd like to go ahead and just show some of these additional resources that were mentioned earlier by Leslie. We have the trial of Publisher 2013. I also will include the links to the product pages if you'd like to request a donation of it for your organization. If you would like to make the switch to Publisher 2013, there's a helpful video on how that works. You can look at the Office or the Answers Forum and the Office blog that Leslie mentioned, and then also get more information about Software Assurance. And I know Nicole chatted that link out to a few people, and we'll include that in the follow-up email as well. Join us next week as well. We have a related webinar on Microsoft OneNote, Capture Your Creativity, next week at 11 a.m. on Thursday Pacific Time and 2 p.m. Eastern. So we hope you'll join us for that if you'd like to learn about using OneNote in your organization. And we also have an archive of the new Microsoft Office if you're thinking about potentially upgrading to the newest version. This takes you through some of the newer features in the entire Office Suite. I'd like to thank our presenter, Leslie, for joining us today. We really appreciate your contribution and time to answer questions. And we're sorry we didn't get to everybody. And we'd also like to thank our webinar sponsor, ReadyTalk, for donating their product for our use to be able to provide these webinars every week. Thank you so much for joining us. And please take a moment when we're done, once the screen closes, to complete your post-event survey. 5 equals excellent, 1 equals poor. Help us improve our program so that we can bring you better webinars from week to week from now on. So thank you everyone for joining us, and we hope you'll have a terrific day. <laughs>